The Puppet Master's Regime. Have you ever heard of the musical The Puppet Master's Regime? Most likely you haven't. In fact, most diehard theater lovers are often unfamiliar with this little production. It was a 1934 stage musical written by anonymous authors of the music, lyrics, and book. It starred upcoming performers such as Timmy Cutie Pie Wright, Sally Wilkes, Henry Gregory, as well as many others. At the time, it was the most expensive show to date. It was said to be the biggest, most spectacular stage show to San Francisco and back. From the Testament of Tyler Warwick, 1901 to 1983. I went to see the show about a week after I turned 33. The ticket was a gift from my sister, who knew how much I loved the theater. I remember the signs. They were huge and rather gaudy. Oh, and the playbill. It was just a single red dot with a doll-like face on it. It seemed a bit melancholy for what I assumed was to be a musical comedy, but I didn't pay much attention. I was going to see a Broadway show. From the Testament of Georgina Long, 1911 to 1984. The cast was made completely of new people, young children and adults alike who were longing to get back on stage after vaudeville became old news. It was quite charming, really. But I did take bit of notice to that odd little playbill. All the playwrights and lyricists and everyone were all unnamed. And that design. It was a little red drop with a peculiar little face in it. Not even a title. Just that little red dot. I'd come to New York with my parents on an impromptu vacation after my grandmother had died. A Broadway musical seemed just like what we needed. From the Testament of Carnal Hannigan, 1920 to 1993. I do recall most of the first act. Then again, who could forget? The story was a little hard to follow at first. There was a little boy who lived in a puppet shop, or maybe he lived down the street. No, no, he worked in the puppet shop, but he was homeless, so they provided him with a home there. The kid's name was Mori Mortem, something weird. Yes, it was like Morietum, or no, Morietter. Yeah, Morietter, yes. Anyway, Morietter's employer was this old man named Mr. Obsizer. I remember his name because his character was unimaginably unsettling bouncing all around and getting angry, and the little boy, all while keeping his nasal, gigglish voice. Anyhow, the production opened to Morietter and the odd fellow getting into an argument over the boy not doing his work. Then two of them sang this peculiar number about puppets. It wasn't a normal song, or at least the musicality wasn't normal. The lyrics were very enchanting, and the music did this odd, flowing thing about the room. Instruments would get very quiet without losing any power to it. Maybe it was just the acoustics. I'm most likely explaining it all wrong. Oh well, but in time, we got used to it, and the show progressed. From the Testament of Gabriel Johnston, 1919 to 1976. This youngster, Maury, Morietta or something like that, was quite insecure about his stay in the puppet shop very paranoid that his boss would throw him out. I was an aspiring lyricist at the time, and I'd done the lyrics to a few original community theater projects, so I was fascinated with the wording in these songs. I scribbled down a few lyrics after I'd went home. Unless I'm remembering wrong, the little puppet shop boy and Mr. Obie something had an introductory duet, and then Morietta went off and had a short lament in a different, much more somber tune. If I stay and do everything right, I can live in the day and steer, stay clear of the night. Out there in the night, in the dark, there's a world of whys, lies. I can hear them whisper, and sometimes I can see their eyes. The eyes comment confused me for a moment, but then I assumed that he was meaning the stars. It seemed as though the number was unnecessarily tragic and poorly situated within the show, but it was a minor quibble. Now, Morietta had a girlfriend named Trahunt and a boyfriend named Adolabit. After interrupting the final note in his lament, they all gushed about how much they loved puppets, but they couldn't afford one from Morietta's guardian's shop. 
And so they transitioned into this vibrant little song about joining forces to raise money so they could afford to build their own puppet. After this, the three all headed for school, and the story took a sharp turn in a different direction, after several attempts to begin again. Now, they had this really nasty teacher or headmistress named uh, Madame Riparia, or something like that. They had a reprise of the song from before, and she overheard them. And at first her remarks about the children's fantasy were somewhat comical. But then the light fixed on her, and she sang this heartbreaking little song. What the song was about was up for interpretation. It was somewhat about love, but it had all these strange puppet metaphors. The only lyric that stayed with me is, Stroll through the wood cracks, show them your pains, the hole in your throat, and the strings in your veins. Then, she just went on this little breakdown. I assumed it was a poorly conceived character trait. She started singing off-key and went to beat one of the kids. And then the curtain fell, and there was a scuffle heard on stage. People whispered to each other, but a rising new orchestra piece silenced us. The curtain rose again, and we were right outside the puppet shop. From the Testament of Lewis Roberts, 1905 to 1967. Morietter and his friends went into the town and sang a song about selling dolls, I think it was, because the little girl made dolls in her spare time, and she had to sell them. I remember those strange background characters. The company was so absolutely monotonous. They all wore some form of dark clothing, and each of them were very, very tall. I can remember how they all had their faces covered up by hair or hats or veils. None of them spoke. None of them even sang during the course of the show. They just walked in perfectly straight lines, as if they weren't even part of the production. Anyways, this strange song about buying dolls, it had absolutely no life. But for some reason, these children were putting their all into it. I could see the pain in their faces as they hit those high notes. And something else. As the lyrics went on, they seemed to get a little, um, it's so hard to explain. They all looked like they were hurting a little. They looked so pale and nervous all of a sudden. Coming from a stage family, I convinced myself that it was only stage fright, but it still made me just a tiny bit anxious. From the Testament of Carrie Laurie, 1921 to 1995. The kids all got their money from this strange man in cloak who sang a simple little tune. I still remember the lyrics. Uh, Despite the fall of rain, little kitties, everyone needs a little song. Wooden dolls give you pain, little kitties. Go on, little kitties, run along. His character was never really explained, but I remember how truly gripping the melody was. So haunting. It got you right there in the gut. Even the little kid actors seemed a bit unsettled by the new turn of the show. They all kept stuttering over their lines as they spoke and sang, and then a light bulb over the stage went out. Everyone kind of gasped, and one man, I think, even laughed. The noise it made really spooked the little girl, little Miss What's-Her-Name. All the names were so very strange. All I know is that a light bulb had gone out, and the actors were stumbling across the stage, and the whole thing looked like a terrible flop. When the children re-entered the puppet shop, they presented Mr. Upsizer with the puppet pieces they'd acquired when the audience wasn't looking, singing a braggity sort of chant. We done, we done, diddy done, diddy done, did it. It was obnoxious, but thankfully brief. After that, the light fixed on Morietta, and he began another tune. The song was a dud, and all I remember was that he flubbed the last line. The lyric had something to do with the final stroke of light, or some sort of long-winded, moon-based metaphor. All I know is that he'd forgot the words, and all that could be heard in that theater was the sound of car horns outside the building. The boy, he didn't seem shocked or embarrassed or nothing, but his posture improved out of the blue, and the orchestra stopped. He projected half of the word sorry, then suddenly he burst forth in wordless vocalization. The music resumed, and the other characters began to join him. From the Testament of Marcus Edgar, 1918 to 1968. So after that bulb went out, the whole set started falling apart. We, the audience, tried our best to ignore it, but it was near impossible. I saw two sets of very angry attendees get up and leave. 
the set piece for the puppet shop screeched its way onto the stage, and we could see in the far back the paper sky background falling down. The lights went dim in what we assumed was an attempt to hide the malfunctioning set pieces. The kids, with the help of an oddly monotonous Mr. Obsizer, constructed the puppet, and this strange song played. To this day, I don't know what they were saying. It sounded vaguely like Latin, but I went on to study Latin in college the next year and found that guess to come out flat. I remember how it enchanted me, though. It enchanted all of us. We all began to feel this thing course through us. I remember a few people around us who were humming in an attempt to rid themselves of the sound, and I could hear people in the front rows crying out in what sounded like pain. The actors themselves sounded as though they were about to pass out at any moment. They were doing this odd sort of ballet, and they were tripping all over themselves, and a few more lights started flashing and breaking. We all sat and waited for the song to end when, when, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I I can't. From the Testament of George Frank, 1899 to 1999. The lights were going on and off at random, and we were all praying the damn song would end soon. It had this force going with it. It was sucking us in. We could feel it. The little kids and the puppet man were dancing all around when, well, you see, I really thought I could do it. I thought I could do it. I was right there in the fifth row, so I saw, but I can't. From the Testament of Carolyn Mark, 1901 to 1949. The lighting was completely out of control. It was a mess. And that song, it was awful. But something about it, it was powerful. It had a force. I watched intently as the dancers began to skip around and, and we, I thought they were the lights. Conclusion. The actual events of the final scene of Act One of the Puppet Master's regime has been up for debate for many years. Not many people are willing to speak out about what happened on stage during those final moments. Many believe that there is no actual record of an interview with somebody who is willing to tell the story. This is not true, as one testament survives from a Billy Prescott who was only six at the time of the show. At such a young age, one might assume he was less affected by what he recalls happening. I was just a kid, so I don't remember much. All I can vaguely recall is that song. It was giving me a headache. I turned to my father to ask him if we could leave, when suddenly I saw the stage illuminate with this bright red light. The music stopped as one instrument after another died out, and I swear I heard pounding underneath the stage. Everyone was questioning what was happening, even the actors. I remember that teacher lady being pushed through the door of the shop, and then everyone else came flying in from off stage, toppling on top of each other like rag dolls. There were people there who didn't fit the design scheme of the production, stage hands and technical workers, I assume, now. I remember the little girl screamed at the audience, then ran behind the shopkeeper while other actors continued singing. A few people started crying right there on the stage when suddenly this curtain came forward. It's hard to describe what it looked like. It was a clear plastic wall, and it came down from above. Several years later, I saw Carrie the Musical on Broadway during one of its few runs. That thing that came down on the prom goers when Carrie was using laser lights to kill everyone? It was just like that. A bunch of set pieces from earlier scenes came down on the sides of the stage, trapping all of the actors in the center. Then the chaos erupted. The actors stopped singing and were pounding on the plastic wall. Then, for some reason, they began to back away, as if some unseen assailants were coming towards them. They fled to the back of the stage, all except the little boy. The little boy who hadn't stopped singing. Then, amid all that screaming and crying and shooting, the curtain flew out, and everything was in silence. Due to that odd abruptness, the audience thought it was just a horrible ending to a terrible musical. We were about to get up when suddenly the curtain opened again, revealing the stationary plastic wall upon which was a single light fixed on the little boy, Morietta. He had clawed his way through the plastic wall. We could see the blood on his hands, but the way he looked was... There were strings attached to every part of his body. 
We could all see his stomach, or lack of, anyway. It was like somebody had put a huge ice cream scooper in his belly. He was sobbing all over the stage, twitching and swinging around. It was a sight so unnatural looking, so painful and twisted and wrong. Even now, I can't seem to wrap my head around how, but, and, and, so, and so everyone looked at him, not knowing what to do. And then he spoke. Help me. Please, help me. It was all I could make out. And then he vomited and suddenly collapsed. The plastic wall lifted and all the lights came on. We saw the rest of them. They were all dead. Every one of them looked exactly like the little boy. Everyone had those strings attached, and we watched as all of them, even the little boy, as their strings were pulled on. Their lifeless bodies rose on cue, and they bowed. However, we cannot be certain that this is a credible account, but unfortunately, it's all we have to work with. The Puppet Master's regime sparked horrible debate among the theater companies. Several audience members had to be treated to special therapy for years to come, and the show itself was covered up by the police. For years to come, the theater company, as well as the police department, who had never managed to solve the gruesome murders of the cast and crew of the show, denied that the play ever existed. However, in recent years, the story has resurfaced, sparking much new debate on the subject. The theater that housed the musical still refuses to acknowledge the show's existence, and most theater historians know nothing about the show in general. To this day, the identities of the anonymous lyric and music writers are unknown, and, to our knowledge, all recordings of the songs and police reports have been destroyed. However, through certain pieces of historical documentation, we can gather a bit of information on the production. The show itself had its first workshop in London in 1928. One of the songs, Get a Puppet, was recorded with vocals by 12-year-old Garris Creeley. However, this recording has been lost, but is supposedly available in the black market of the internet. Other than that, no official records were ever made. Some ancient accounts say that an illegal audio taping of the final scene of Act 1 was recorded from backstage but we cannot be certain that this is anything but a rumor. As for any official memorabilia, very little of anything has survived. Until her death in 1994, theatrical historian Gladys Masters kept two large-scale posters, which she displayed at charity events, but these have since disappeared. Early costumes by Alice Lively, who had been the costume designer on Puppet Master until she quit after payment disputes, are on display at the Pickett Donny Theatrical Museum in Dover, England. Other than that, playbills from its premiere night were given out, but most audience members destroyed their copies after seeing the show. Legend has it, around 10 to 20 survive. On another note, over the years, the show has grown a small cult fan base, and here recently, an off-Broadway revival has been scheduled to premiere soon. Hey everybody, this is Winter Freshest. I just wanted to say thank you for taking time out of your day to watch one of my videos. If you enjoy my videos, feel free to like and subscribe. Also, if you have any requests for other narrations, please comment down below. Thanks again everyone.